Warning, this episode may contain content that is not suitable for children. Viewer discretion is advised. Hey everybody, welcome to LED Live, where we are going to expose the darkness with the light of Christ. That is what we aim to do, and we're excited to talk about this topic here today, pornography. Find out on this episode of LED Live. Light exposing darkness. I think it's something that is not talked about enough. We have a special guest, very excited, Michael Carducci. Welcome to the show. Thank you. And uh, if you guys have not heard of the Coming Out Ministries, we will put a link in the description below. You guys got to check out this ministry. They are literally putting their finger on the pulse of a cutting edge uh, topic, homosexuality, transgender, pornography, sexual addiction. They handle quite a few uh, different types of topics. You guys got to check this ministry out. Powerful, powerful messages and really showing that you know, Christ can see us through all of this and it's really about a relationship with him. So I'm excited to really dive into this topic of pornography. Um, I, I think that if everyone is honest at some point in anyone's life, it's a given time you are probably exposed to it at some point in time. And so I think that this is a bigger problem than we can even probably admit. And we need some, some information on this, so. Cool. Oh, well, Scotty, I just want to thank you for, um, as a matter of fact, when I met you nine years ago, it was Little Light Studios that actually gave us our first break at a meeting. You actually funded the, um, the, the booth for us, and that's how we began our ministry nine years ago. And what's been amazing is that you're not afraid to address these really difficult topics. So um, thank you for giving a voice to the community. Awesome. Because I, I know that the reason why you have 22,000 uh, viewers is because you're willing to ask the really difficult questions. Awesome. So I'm really awesome. grateful. So basically, as I go around talking about the porn issue, what I want to do is I want to relate to um, not only the, the issue of pornography, but also some practical steps on how to find victory in that. Because um, a lot of times people have this tendency to think that either I'll be delivered instantly or I'm just going to be condemned eternally. And so uh, in my own walk, coming out of pornography addiction, I fell back into it even as an elder in my church. And so uh, the things that worked before didn't work again. And so I needed new tools. But as I was sincerely asking God to show me, um, those victories started to come. But I had to recognize that this was a process and not an event. And I think that that actually gives people hope to, to not tell them that they have a right to in, indulge in their sin, but that if they find themselves in a fallen situation, how is it that I can get back up and, and move forward and to ultimately find that victory again? And so that's what this presentation is designed to do. Basically, we want out. You know, I wanted out of this thing that I felt trapped in. At 13 years old, I discovered masturbation. I, I checked out a book in the library. Um, there wasn't YouTube around back then. There wasn't even a computer around back then. And so I self-taught myself, and back then I wasn't um, a Christian per se, uh, and I didn't feel necessarily uh, an obligation or a commitment or, or even that I felt guilty about it, but I knew that there was something that was holding me back from sharing what I was indulging in. But, you know, for me, a kid that was, you know, small in stature, I wasn't accepted by the boys in school, and I was beat up by my older sister. We were living in a low-income housing project in Detroit, Michigan, and my mom was a single mother working two jobs. Time was, times were tough. If my sister wasn't beating me up and throwing me down a flight of stairs, um, you know, I, I got picked on at school as well. But the only relief that I found was 10 minutes in the bathroom several times a day. And that became not only this um, escape for me, but it also became what I call my best friend. And so then all of a sudden I come into a relationship with Jesus Christ and I understand now that this is wrong behavior. And so, okay, well, I want to serve you, God, but this thing had become uh, the master of my, of my life. And so uh, to give this thing up was really difficult. And so I want to uh, process that a little bit. But this definitely, I think, helps to explain where all of us are at when we're trapped into some type of sexual sin. What's going on now is that the enemy's onslaught towards our young people is is uh, exponentially much worse than it ever was when I was a child. And so this is just an example to show about computers and how parents have a lack of understanding about how the enemy, the pornography industry, is out to slam your children. Here's a typical uh, situation where uh, I think it's Billy's got a the laptop in the room with his friends and mom is just very ignorant about what's really going on. Billy, do you have a the laptop with your friends in your bedroom. And 
But he's like, yeah, uh, Ma, we're doing homework. But you can see by, you know, what's on the door that they're not looking at, at homework. They're not doing their homework. And, and a lot of parents are really ignorant, thinking that, oh, you know, my child is eight or nine years old. They're not even sexual, so that's not even an issue. But I'm going to really unpack some of the ways that the pornography industry is targeting not only our children, but also sliming them at such a rapid rate now. Now, what's kind of crazy is, okay, this has been going on in the home. I have little nieces that are in high school. Mm -hmm. And now that computers are being so utilized in schooling situations, they literally sit around the desk and show each other the latest and greatest crazy porn thing that they have. I mean, the teachers are right in the room mm -hmm. and they have no idea. And all the kids are just sitting around watching like, like crazy porn. Are you talking about public school or are you talking about private public school? Public school. Okay. Public school. But I'm sure it goes on in private school as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it really does. It really does. So every second, according to Covenant Eyes, $3,000 is being spent on pornography. That's $11 million every hour. Every second, 28,000 people are viewing pornography. That's 102 million people every hour. Talking about the fact that pornography doesn't care if you're a Christian or not. The average first age of internet exposure to porn is 11 years old. 15 to 17 year olds having viewed uh, multiple hardcore exposures, 80%, and 8 to 16 year olds having viewed pornography online, 90% and mostly while doing homework. Wow. There, I, I heard a story about how a mother didn't want the computer in her home, but her child was starting first grade. And so the husband insisted, they got a laptop, and one day as her little boy was opening up the computer screen, her, the father had forgotten to clear his history. Mm -hmm. And the boy was instantly slimed with hardcore pornography. The mother saw that, and here, isn't that sad to think that the father, his own issue was what slimed his own son at six years old. Wow. People have no idea what the internet is out there um, designed to do. The pornography industry knows that the sooner that they can expose your child to pornography, the sooner that they can hook them. Uh, they've done studies and that they've shown that to a brain that is fully developed, about the age of 28, 29 for a man, 27, 28 for a girl, that the first exposure to pornography for them is repulsive. But to a child whose brain isn't fully developed, it actually hooks them. It creates this addictive drive. I was 10 years old when my mother gave me my father's pornography magazines. My mom could tell that I had some you know, issues with my own gender identity. And so my mother thought that maybe these would help me. But I remember looking at the images on the screen and even being 58 years old myself, I still remember the names of some of the centerfolds. I also remember the images that I was looking at. But as I was looking at those images, it did captivate me. I, I knew that I was looking at something that I thought was kind of forbidden. But as I looked at those beautiful images of the women, instead of desiring to have them sexually, I desired to be like them. Because I thought, well, if men lust after this, if men desire to have this, then I must become that so that men would desire me. It wasn't sexualized for me at that time. For me, it was an identity issue. But now they find that the sooner that you can expose a young person to porn, it hooks them. I have a young seminary student that came up to me and he said that his addiction to pornography began when he was seven years old. Father's a pastor, mother's a nurse, they kept the computer in the family room where everyone had access to it and they could watch what their children were looking at. But at seven years old, he went to a Christian school and his best friend came with a piece of pornography that they had printed off the computer. And when he showed him that to his friend, that's what hooked him. He would set his alarm for three o'clock in the morning every night so that he could access the family computer in the family room and look at pornography at seven years old. Wow. Parents have absolutely no idea what this issue is doing to their children and they live in this fantasy world thinking that their children don't struggle with it and if a child has access to anything that is unsupervised, whether it's a cell phone, an iPad, or a computer, your children are absolutely defenseless. Mm -hmm. Pornography industry is larger than the top revenues of the top technology companies combined. You take Microsoft, Google, Amazon, eBay, Yahoo, Apple, Netflix, and Earthling combined, and pornography still t makes more. As a matter of fact, pornography makes to the average of $32 billion annually. Wow. And that, that, those increases have exponentially risen in the last few years. This makes me think of what Scotty was saying the other day about what, what money does it take to cure the world hunger? I mean, it, there's plenty of free porn out there. Imagine if all the money that was going to, towards porn could help cure poverty around the world. I mean, yeah. it's just amazing. You know, it's our fault that poverty exists because of we're not caring for, we're not putting the money where it go, should go. Right. We care more about frivolous, like self-indulged pleasure than we do about our own fellow humanity that is dying. Yeah, yeah. that's crazy.
but I don't want to minimize what you're saying is very, um, um, it, it, it's very spiritual, but we're talking about an addiction. And so mm -hmm. it isn't an issue of whether people are saying, should I spend this dollar to feed the hungry or, or, or indulge in porn? It's like, I need my fix. Mm -hmm. And like a heroin addict, they don't care about the needs of other people around them. When you're an addict, we're talking about an addictive drive. And so I don't want to minimize that right. for somebody out there thinking that, oh, you know, I'm less of a Christian because I, I don't choose to help the poor. You really have a problem. Yeah. And the reason why you're spending money on porn is not because you're selfish and <laughs> that you want to, mm -hmm. you know, reward yourself. It's because you're truly addicted. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. I was talking to a young woman two years ago who I went on a mission trip with, and she's 25 years old, beautiful young girl, active in her youth group, and she was telling me that she was addicted to pornography and masturbation and acting out sexually with some of the guys in her youth group. And I looked at her in shock and I said, well, you know what the Bible says about sex, don't you? And she said, not really, because the church never talks about it. I believe that by our silence, we are giving our children permission to buy into the things that they're hearing on YouTube, the things that the kids are sharing in school, and by our silence that we're actually encouraging uh, the, the sexual onslaught that's going on with our young people. According to Covenant Eyes, the most startling statistic that I have is that only 3% of boys and 17% of girls have never seen pornography. That's amazing. 3%. Wow. 3%. Wow. <laughs> of what age range? I mean... It just says boys. I don't know just, what their demographic is. Probably, probably across the ever. Board. Yeah, probably. Is. You know what I mean? But they're not 18. Yeah. Right? Yeah. What if part of our uh, Laodicea was the fact that we're not acknowledging the fact that we're being slimed by sexual sin? Take a look at this. Testimonies on sexual behavior, adultery, and divorce, page 84. It says, Satan's repetitious plots. Near the close of this earth's history, Satan will work with all his powers in the same manner and with the same temptations wherewith he tempted ancient Israel just before they're entering the land of promise. He will lay snares for those who claim to keep the commandments of God and who are almost on the borders of the heavenly Canaan. He said he will use his powers to their utmost in order to entrap souls and to take God's professed people upon their weakest points. What are those weakest points? Those who have not brought the lower passions into subjection to the higher powers of their being, those who have allowed their minds to flow in a channel of carnal indulgence of the baser passions Satan is determined to destroy with his temptations to pollute their souls with licentiousness. That's sexuality, with sexual thoughts. And so now the party comes right into your home. Right. The party's in your hand, right? Mm -hmm. Isn't that interesting that the devil will use these devices that we have total access to 24-7 and, and what it does is it gives us the ability to access this pornography. I think it's amazing that that our church is so ignorant or, or they are purposeful to not talk about this issue because of course it's a very difficult topic. But what I find is no matter where I go around the world is that the, that the church is ready to talk about this. But the leadership, because maybe it's the fact that 62% of our, ad, that our Christian pastors struggle with pornography addiction. So even on that issue alone, maybe that's why the secrecy or, or just the fact that 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 is part of the Laodicea is to not address the sexual sin in the church. But you know what's awesome is ministries like us, we have enjoyed a freedom of, of having uh, the ability to put stuff out on YouTube. I mean, people can research this topic and look and see what kind of things are out there. Uh, we're not determined to the leadership of the church allowing us to be able to talk about this kind of an issue. And and so now I think we, we are, are starting to see that we, we can actually have access and actually start to do it. But more of us need to talk about this than just one ministry or two ministries. It needs to be across the board. I mean, all around the world, people are struggling with this. In my opinion, this is enemy number one in the church. It's not the LGBT issue, it's the pornography issue is number one and sexual sin in our church. It's a sad reality that we've gotten to the point where, you know, like you mentioned this young lady and she's like, well, the church isn't talking about it. But at some point, every person who says they become a Christian, does have a responsibility to go to the Bible first and say, what answers does the Bible have for me? If they don't find the answers in the Bible, then they should be asking the church where those answers are. But, but in reality, we all have a responsibility to go to the Bible and search those answers out, That's right. right? Because at, at, our, at our core, like we're answerable to God first, and His Word has to be paramount. Um, in the church or in society or, or whatever, you know, it has to be held in the highest regard. If it's not, then, you know, we got, we got bigger problems. So that, that's one thing that I would like to bring out is that 
first we should be going to the Bible and, and looking for those answers. If we can't find them, then yeah, go to somebody who's more knowledgeable than you. But we can't just put that on the church and say it's the church's fault because right. we are responsible too because right. we have access to it. Yeah. It's not like... You know, it's locked up and a priest can interpret it for us. No, we all have, in fact, most of us probably have multiple Bibles in our homes. We have access. It's all over the internet. You can go to any Bible website and search the Word of God for these things. So it can't be all on the church. At some point, we have to take ownership and take responsibility as well. Keith, I'm so glad you said that because I think that that's really where the responsibility comes from. So here, here's the struggle, and, and, and as parents, you understand the struggle, like how much do I say to my kid that doesn't instruct them on sexual sin, but how do I say enough to protect them from the onslaught of what they're getting out there? If you wait until your child is, is at the age of puberty to start having these conversations, you've waited too long because again, by the time they're eight or nine years old, the kids are sharing with them, they're showing them stuff, they're already talking to them, and so you've waited too long. A lot of times parents are really wanting to restrict their kids from listening to our presentations because they think that their kids haven't been exposed to anything. But doesn't it make sense that if they're going to hear the truth, shouldn't they hear the truth from us? Yes, and who do they respect more than, than their mother or their father? Certainly not the pastor or their Sabbath school teacher. And so those conversations, in my opinion, absolutely need to be coming from the mothers and the fathers. And, and one more point that I want to make, especially um, um, when regarding um, issues like sexuality or identity, is that the fathers really have an ultimate responsibility to speak masculinity to their sons. So when a mother tells her son about sex, that's emasculating even in itself, and, and it detaches even that boy from, from the masculine identity from his father. Those conversations, in my opinion, really are much more affirming when they come from the same sex parent. Hmm. That makes sense. You know, I heard a really interesting testimony from um, uh, a mother that was talking about when is it appropriate to actually engage in conversation about sexuality with their kid. And um, she had mentioned that by, you know, like you said, seven, eight years old, they're already starting to get curious from friends or school or whatever the other kids have been exposed to it. And they're starting to ask questions or talk about it to your kid. So whether you like it or not, your kid's going to get some information. And her testimony was really saying, um, instead of making it this awkward, strange thing, um, you know, the kid will naturally go and ask their, ask their parents about it uh, if it feels like it's a safe environment. And she made it a special thing. She said, you know what? Um, I'll tell you about it tonight. Let's have a really nice dinner. What's your favorite dinner? And we'll sit down and we'll have a discussion about it. And it was a beautiful, like, the way she talked about, you know, God had this special plan between a man and a woman. And she beat that information to that child and her her um, take on that was really that if you can beat the child to proper information then when the child hears it from a schoolmate and it's like totally you know in the wrong context or or something really bad then the kid goes no my mother told me that this is the way that it is and yeah. they have a proper context mm -hmm. but when you play catch up Meaning like you're now trying to instill the proper way after someone else has already told your kid the wrong way. It's just that much harder to, to re-correct that. Going even further, I think this is a great opportunity to deepen the child's trust in the Bible. You know, First Timothy says that the Bible is good for instructions in all things. And the Bible isn't just about God's love. There's also some pretty interesting stories in there dealing with sexuality and relationships. Mm -hmm. So opening that up to a child and saying, hey, this is what the Bible says about this as well, gives them that opportunity that, yes, I can trust my parent, but if I have questions, I could also go to the Bible. Mm -hmm. yeah. Amen. Awesome. I, I want to touch on that because there was a story that this woman told me that just absolutely brought me to tears. I, I, I couldn't believe just the candidness. And she looked she looked like Rebecca of Donnybrook Farm. She had her hair pulled back in a little ponytail and she was wearing like this perfect little outfit and she was a, a pastor's wife. And she came up to us after a Q&A for a group of pastor's wives and she goes, oh, I understand everything that you've been through. And I looked at this lady who looked like Adventist perfection and I looked at her and I go, no lady, you don't have a clue what I've been through. And she started to tell us her story and she said, you know, when I was a little girl, I was obsessed with wanting to see a man naked. And I was like, oh, what? Mm -hmm. And she went to her mother. And, and because she had a good relationship with her mother, and I think this is the whole point of what I'm getting to and what you were talking about, she went to her mother and she said, mother, I want to see a man naked. And her mother didn't guilt her or shame her. And she thought, well, 
I don't really have a man to show you. I guess we could ask your father. She said, no, no, I don't want to see father. <laughs> but what she did is she answered a question and she said, well, men have more muscles than women. She described it. And then she said, you know, they have more hair than, than women do. And, and that seemed to suffice her. So she didn't shame her. She didn't guilt her. So she still had this open access to her mother for, for mm -hmm. honest information. So a few years later, she was cleaning out this house. Somebody was moving out and she was cleaning out this house for somebody to move into. She opened up a cupboard door in the garage and there was a centerfold of a naked lumberjack leaning against a tree, a man. And she ripped it down and she hid it so that her brothers and sisters couldn't see it. Well, who do you think she ran to? Hmm. She ran to her mother. I never would have run to my mother or my father, but wow. she did because she had that open relationship with her mom and she pulled it out and she goes, look mother, a naked man. And her mother didn't like shame her and grab it and rip it up and throw it away and say, shame on you for looking at such a filthy thing. But she said, now look at that. And she said, wasn't I right? He's got more muscles than we do. He's got more <laughs> hair. You know, she affirmed the biology, but then she took it to the face and she said, but look at his face. What do you... What do you think he's thinking about? What's he doing? She's like, well, he's smiling, mother. Well, what do you think he's smiling about? Do you think he knows Jesus? Mm. Well, I don't know, mother. She said, do you think he's married? Oh, I don't know. Do you think that as a Christian married man that he holds the door open for his wife? And what she did is she took it from the biology wow. to the spiritual, and she started to affirm that a man's value actually has more to do with her sexuality or is more important than that. And what was so beautiful, I was sitting there with tears coming down my face, because I thought to myself, wow, how much easier my life could have been if I'd have had that open access to my parents where I could trust them to share everything with them. And a lot of times I hear parents say that they tell their kids, oh, you know, don't think about sex and sex is a filthy, horrible thing. And you start putting these ideas in their mind. And then if they do experiment, then they've gotten this, this confirmation from you that sex is dirty, it's awful, it's shameful, and now you've broken off the opportunity to have those valuable conversations to protect your children, and instead you've made them more vulnerable, and in my opinion, you've made them more of a victim. Wow. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing. Um, I really appreciate what you said about getting to the child before basically the world, everyone else gets to them. Um, I remember approaching someone very important in my life and said, hey, why didn't you tell me about X, Y, and Z? And their answer to me was, oh, because you didn't ask. Hmm. And I was so bothered because like, of course I didn't ask. I didn't know what to ask right. until it was like in front of my face. So that is super important, talking yeah. to your kid about things that, you know, may not even be brought up in their mind, but it can come up later on. And I think it is important to, um, distinctly deal with those things whether you have a male or a female like um, my daughter is is uh, nine years old right now and she's already asking questions and she goes to my wife and she should naturally my son is seven years old and isn't asking those kind of questions yet I, I would pray that it's my job to educate him in that area and so I think that that also as parents um, you know, there is a, a, a different role that the mother and the father play in those situations. I don't know if it's necessarily too appropriate for me to explain the nuts and the bolts to my daughter. Mm -hmm. um, um, but yeah, definitely. It, and, and it isn't done in a shameful way to my daughter so that, you know, now it's, 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 it's not this like weird thing and, and she's scared of it now. It's just like, oh yeah, this is what happens um, to married people. Mm -hmm. and she's aware of it now. Yeah. What's so beautiful, though, um, Scotty, is, is talking about the situation is you, you definitely have a role to play in your daughter's life regarding sexuality. But that's not the specifics of what your wife is sharing with her. What's really beautiful is that when little girls, if they're in a safe home, you know, what happens is as they start going through the puberty process, it's this immutable law that the sex that is a mystery becomes the attraction. So if they've been affirmed by femininity, the mom, and they have this good connection with their friends in school, then when puberty hits, it's like, whoa, what's with this sex called boys? And the only boy that they have that's in pro close proximity that they feel safe with is the father. And so it's very natural for the daughter to then turn her attentions towards her father because he's safe and I can experiment with dad to understand more about what boys are. I think that's really powerful and that's where you step in and you're very valuable in your own daughter's development because you have the opportunity to show her what masculinity looks like, to not only make it desirable, but to also give her a pattern of what she should be uh, looking for. And so a father that isn't abusive, that is um, attentive and meets those emotional needs, then she's more likely to pick 
a man that she's going to want to be with based on the example of the father that she had. So your time is coming. I mean, it, you're not yeah. exempt from that, but well, you it, definitely it, have a blessing. It's already that. begun in the way of like uh, my my wife and I have this kind of ongoing conversation about simple touch. Um, you know, how I as a father touch my daughter is opening okay for her to say, oh, well, this is how a male can, can touch me. And so you have to be consciously aware of even, even commenting on things on her body, she's going to become more aware of that. So as a, as a male and as the father, my role to establish and affirm her is, is different than my wife's, but highly important even at this stage. It's so beautiful the way that God ordained it to have fathers and mothers because both of those examples are so powerful whether you're a boy or a girl growing up. Well, question, do you have a suggestion on single parent ho households? If there's a father with a daughter or a mother with uh, a son? Those are huge um, challenges today, especially now that we have the statistic that there are more single mothers raising families than there are dual parents. And they're saying that that statistic now can never be reversed. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember that uh, my family was the first divorce on our street. Whereas now, it's rare to find families that are actually intact in public schools. And, and that is a challenge. I think that's where the church then can step in, especially if you have a situation where there's no um, uh, masculine or, or male role model in the home. Because then, again, you have little girls that don't know how to interact with men, and they have a deficit because they don't have that father's love. So that makes them more vulnerable to want to act out sexually as they become older because they're curious and they have this emptiness to be filled. And then for boys, they need an example of what masculinity looks like that isn't a baseball or basketball player, you know, that isn't a, uh, you know, um, a music hero or someone like that. So without those examples, both the male and the female have, have great deficits going into adulthood. But if the church had a safe place, and for those single mothers, you know, wouldn't it be something if we could provide like a like a boys club or a men's club, you know, for these children uh, where, you know, different men could take turns, maybe take a, a weekend a month to actually affirm that child or to begin a relationship that was safe, you know, that wasn't going to abuse them or, or hurt them, but instead instill in them good principles and to show them what masculinity really looks like. Um, a grandfather, mm -hmm. you know, maybe the, the mother's father could step in and to be that role model for, for either the male or the female child. But it is a very important um, a position, in my opinion, that's missing. And, and I believe that the church has an obligation and an opportunity to affirm what Christian masculinity looks like uh, to a, a male child or to a female child. I was at a church in Florida that um, they started out really small, just a, a men's group that began praying on, on, on the weekends with, with the other men when they would meet at church. And in one year's time, they said it revolutionized the entire church. Wow. It was packed when I came into it. And, and I mean, it took an hour for them to get around the room and pray and everything. And there was tons of, of young teenage um, boys in the room that were um, mentioning how they didn't have a father and that this was fulfilling a role in their life. So yeah, like you said, I mean, that, that could be wow. huge for the church to step in and, and, and to start filling some of those gaps. That's exactly what I'm talking about. I, I want to segue a little bit to uh, Tim's story. And I think what's amazing is that even though he didn't have necessarily that open communication with his parents, um, that a situation happens where he becomes exposed. And what's so amazing about God is that he will do anything to bring us to help. And sometimes being exposed is sometimes the only way that God can really reach us. And, and I think that Tim's story is beautiful because even in his exposure, it's very redemptive and I, I want to share this with you. Nobody wants to live with a secret. It torments your soul, it bothers your conscience. I created this guy that everybody loved and I went home and didn't like myself. The effect of holding a secret that long is that you never had the freedom to be you. I don't carry secrets anymore. One day, we were playing in a neighborhood. I grew up in a nice little neighborhood and um, just playing with some friends. There was a neighbor that lived across the street from me. And, uh, told me to 
come over to his house. So I came over to his house and didn't go inside the house. He said, you know, come in the garage. I got to show you something. And so I go into the garage and um, he just starts touching me. Just inappropriate um, touching. And I was eight. I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know what he was doing. Um, but I knew it wasn't right. And I came home and I walked in the door and my mom asked me, how was my day? That was the day I became a professional liar. And uh, I got real good at it. Um, a couple of days later, I got called to the garage again. And again. I don't know how to process this. I don't know where to begin with this. I don't know how to deal with this. All I did know is that if my dad found out, he would kill him. So I had to keep it a secret. I was literally becoming two different people. There would be the guy that could go to school and kind of get through a day. And then there would be the guy that cannot stop looking at pornography. This is not casual. This is, I can't stop. I'm driven to this thing. So I had to keep it a secret. I don't want to deal with these questions. I don't have answers for this. I'm 12. I'm 13. 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, I'm 19, and this thing is still on me. She caught me. I didn't know what to say. I was embarrassed. I felt like a pervert. I felt completely disgusted with myself. Because she's a praying woman, she went back to her room and started praying for me. It's probably the best prayer I think my mother has ever prayed. I didn't hear it. But that prayer came and got me. I got up, cleaned myself off, walked down the hallway. If I made a left, I'm gonna go to my room. I'm never gonna talk about this again. If I make a right, maybe I'd have enough strength to go in her room and tell her what the real situation was. Cause it wasn't porn. That was, that wasn't the root of the situation. Mom cried, I cried, and uh, then she went and got my younger brother. He came in the room. He said he got molested by the same guy. Then all three of us cried. My dad comes home, we share what happened, and then my mom says that she got sexually abused when she was six, and then my dad says that he got molested when he was five. So in one night, my exposure caused everyone to kind of come clean and confess. Uh, their pain. I mean, that night, man, oh, I just can't articulate to you the freedom I felt 
to be able to tell the truth to somebody and not be judged. It's the most, oh my God, you. And to have the truth come out and be surrounded by nothing but love. My parents, their relationship with Christ uh, is amazing. They have always been authentic and real in how they live out their faith. Man, I just thank God that they weren't like the type of deep religious people that can't handle pain. I, I was just happy that they were, that they loved me, that they didn't judge me. We didn't grow up in an atmosphere where we saw any hypocrisy. My parents weren't one way at home and then another way at church. They were the same people. And um, they told us the right way. They showed us the right way. And then they just prayed for us. And, um, you know, when the Lord got ready for us, when he called, we knew his voice because they taught us well. I would love to tell you that as soon as I accepted Christ into my life, I put porn down and never picked it up again. Uh, but the fact that the Lord would be patient enough with me, knowing that it didn't take me five minutes to get into it, and it probably wasn't gonna take five minutes to get out. But if I just started walking with him, he would just start shedding layers of bondage and abuse, molestation, low self-esteem, people pleasing, this stuff, as we began to walk, stuff would just start falling off of me. Um, and that he would give me relationships. When God really wants to love you, he loves you through people. And uh, he brought people into my life to literally love all that crap out of me. And it's been a great walk. 14 years, still walking. It's been good. So, I don't carry secrets anymore. My name is Tim Ross, and I am second. What I find so beautiful is that is that God allowed him to be exposed. I mean, imagine how embarrassing that would be to have your mother find you that way. But how beautiful it, that at the end of the night, everyone had been able to confess that they had also been through the same experience and imagine the healing that this family found together. What I think is really powerful is the fact that Tim says that even though he accepted Christ, that he still struggled. He said it took more than five minutes to get into this mess. Doesn't it make sense that it would be more than five minutes to get out? That was really comforting for me, especially even struggling again as an elder in my church with this pornography issue, like how was I going to find this victory? And if it didn't happen instantaneously, was I doing it wrong? And what that does is it reminds me of the story in Proverbs about the, the two men, the righteous man and the wicked man. You know, the wicked man falls into mischief, you know, but the righteous man falls seven times. So they both fall. But the difference is, is that the righteous man kept getting back up kept getting back up and one of the things that I encourage people is is that seven represents not only perfection but a process to perfection and mm -hmm. what that means is that all right so seven is a perfect number but it it also means completion and that if you're willing to get back up each and every time you know it doesn't give you a license to sin but it just says that if you've fallen get back up keep getting back up until you work through the process and that's what I found that in my own relationship with Jesus Christ that I had to keep getting back up and, and again as I would get back up the Lord would help to show me tools that I could use to to help give me the victory over the mind and what I think is so amazing about God is that he doesn't expect us to get it right perfectly and of course he could just he could just flip a switch or, or say a word and I would never struggle with it again but what he wants is he wants this intimacy he wants this dependency on him and so if he gave me immediate relief from my from my struggle then I necessarily wouldn't even increase my relationship with him I would just think that I did this wonderful thing and move on mm -hmm. but in the struggle of falling and getting back up falling and getting back up I had to learn that I had to depend on Jesus like air 
Like, you know, I thought that my greatest curse was the fact that I spent 20 years in gay culture and that I struggled with identity issues and that every second thought that I was having was related to, to my sexuality. And I thought, well, that's not fair. I didn't choose to be gay and I didn't choose to be transgender. But then I realized ultimately that it was now my greatest gift because the Bible says that in your weakness, right, my strength is made perfect. And so what I realized is that I, I didn't have the luxury of having my devotion in the morning and thinking that I'm good all day, is that I had to, to surrender these thoughts and these feelings on a constant basis. And that if I consciously would recognize that I was being tempted and surrender that to God, I got the victory. But he wasn't willing to take away my right to choose. And that through that passage, through that, that test with him, is that I eventually learned that I could rely on his strength and that his strength was greater than my abilities. What was really amazing is that, is that somebody shared this with me, that did you know that if you're standing, that's when you're vulnerable to falling, that you can't fall unless you're standing. And so the idea is to get back up each and every time, no matter what it takes. And you know what? Then taking the word of God, and instead of relying on my feelings, but relying on the word of God, because the word of God said that if I confess my sins, that he is faithful and just, not only to forgive me, but to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. So now that I'm clean, because I claim his word, that doesn't mean that five minutes later, another dirty thought is gonna come into my head. And so here I am at that place again, what am I going to do with that dirty thought? Am I going to indulge in it or am I going to surrender it to God? And so learning that process takes time, just like a muscle. Training a muscle, the more that I, that I curl, I might not be able to curl more than eight pounds. But if I keep up with it after a couple of weeks, I can progress to a 10 pound, 15, 20, and eventually maybe even a 40 pound um, because I've learned how to exercise that muscle. And I believe that the same with the body is the same with the soul. Is through that process, eventually, what used to be a tsunami that would overtake me, now is like a, a fly that I could swat away as I've been learning that process of getting back up each and every time that I would fall. And I think there's something beautiful in that struggle as yes. well because um, I, I worked on a television show um, one time that, that was dealing with this topic of, of um, being overweight and they had surgically like removed the weight did a bunch of like surgical things to these people and were like, you know, if that was the end goal, all it was was just to get rid of the weight and be back to your normal self, right? A magical pill experience. Was it lasting? Every single one of these people fell right back into yeah. it. But it was the people that spent that time in the gym and labored and, and knew what it meant and what it took to get that. They thought twice about eating that donut that second time. Wow. And so when we go through this sinful struggle and we understand like Tim here, you know, it is a miserable place to be in. And, and, and he found victory in, 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 in opening up that and sharing light on it and just talking about it. The secrecy, you know, was what really- Exposed. Yeah. The secrecy was exposed. The secrecy like. was, was what was really keeping him in that space. And so sometimes it takes a lot of courage for us to be open and honest and, and come out. But by shedding light on that, I think we can begin to, to have a road of recovery. Somebody said something to me that was really startling, and they said, don't keep a secret with Satan. And you know, it's interesting because my fear of exposure or my fear of sharing what I was going through was also part of the process that was keeping me from getting help. One of the things that happened as an elder in my church, there was no way I was gonna share with my pastor that was struggling with porn again even though I knew that I wasn't the only one. But what I did is I started going to SA meetings, which is Sex Addicts Anonymous. And so I'd go to these meetings and I at least felt transparent because finally I'm in a group where I can share what I'm struggling with. And even though I was the only one struggling with same-sex attraction, all of these men were struggling also. But after a year of going to these meetings, I wasn't finding any victory, but I was at least finding transparency. How sad that in our church culture is that we feel that we have to guard our secrets, you know, our vulnerabilities because church isn't a safe place you know if you're not going to get gossiped about you might be victimized you know if you shared what you're really going through but I believe that God wants to change the structure of the church to be more like a hospital where we can care for individuals that are hurting and instead of putting on our, our face and packing our garbage in our trunk and coming into church and playing church church should be a place where we can actually find healing and and restoration can you imagine if you actually went to the hospital with an ailment and you were like trying to cover it and be like, you know, I don't know what's wrong with me, but I'm totally wow. fine, yeah. but you have an ailment. It would just seem silly. Mm -hmm. But why do we do that in the church? Right, right. Because I don't believe the church is safe. And I think that that's reasonable. So while I found transparency in this group, one of the things that I think was really disturbing was that I had to say, hi, I'm Mike, I'm a sex addict, every time I shared a word. So 
why would I sit there and identify myself with the one thing that I'm trying to leave? And so identity is important. The Bible says that whatsoever a man thinketh in his heart, that's so he is. So every time I said, hi, I'm Mike, I'm a sex addict, I was connecting myself to the thing that I was trying to leave. It's not a biblical principle. And while it is an AA principle, and I understand it, because if I acknowledge that I'm a sex addict, then what I'm saying is that the victory that I'm walking in is fragile, and that I could fall back into that at any time. But the problem is, is that in Christ, I'm a new creature. Mm -hmm. The old things have been passed away. Behold, everything is brand new. And so I, I want to use the story of Jacob wrestling with Jesus all night long. You know, Jacob means deceiver, liar, right? He was deceitful. And so as Jesus is wrestling with Jacob all night long, Jesus, at one point, he said to him, he says, what's your name? And, and this is really profound for me because Jacob responded appropriately. He said, my name is Jacob, meaning I'm a deceiver, I'm a liar, I'm a cheater. But Jesus said, no, you're not. He said, your name is Israel, mm. and Israel means redeemed. Mm. Wow. How beautiful that Jesus didn't, didn't require that Jacob change his behavior before he came to Christ. He said, come to me as you are and acknowledge what you are, because he said, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just not only to forgive you your sins, but to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So then at that point, he says, your name is now redeemed. Now go and walk in your new identity. Isn't that beautiful? And there are many examples of that, like Abram became Abraham, even before he had Isaac. He said, you are um, uh, you know, father of many nations. He said, now walk in that identity even before it's um, materialized. And so for somebody like me that was transgendered, homosexual, and sexually addicted, that gives me great hope because Jesus is saying is that you're not identified by your history or your memory. He says, you're identified in me. And so my identity is now in Christ. So I'm not a porn addicted Christian. I'm not a uh, homosexual Christian. I'm a Christian alone. Mm. Amen. Amen. So I want to share with you some of the things that I struggled with as I fell back into my porn as an elder in the church. In Child Guidance, page 445, it says, Those who are controlled by their passions cannot be followers of Christ. They are too much devoted to the service of their master, the originator of every evil, to leave their corrupt habits and to choose the service of Christ. So imagine the conviction that came into my heart as I realized that this, of course, was what I was choosing. And even though I felt trapped in this, um, in this sin, I didn't know what was going to help me to get out of it. And while I had had the victory already, I realize now that the things that worked before weren't working anymore. Ecclesiastes 12, 14 says, For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it's good or evil. And so I might be able to put on a good face to you. I might be able to hide my sin from you, but eventually I'm going to have to stand before a holy and righteous God and everything is going to be revealed. And that again came with great conviction. I needed something stronger than I had had before. Okay. So what I had to start doing is I had to start moving from my feelings into faith. And you know, it's interesting because there have been several applications as we've, we've talked about how I relied on my feelings. And, and one of the things that I learned from Little Light Studios is that, you know, let your heart decide. You know, follow your heart. Let your heart decide. And so the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. So I had to recognize and make a distinction that I was letting my emotions rule not only the sin that was in my life, but also the feelings that I would get afterwards. I have a really great testimony of a young guy that talks about how to address that. But as I started to see that as I would fall into my sin, the guilt, the condemnation that would come and that God didn't want me and that my probation had closed and all these things that were covering to me, I had to move from those feelings into the Word of God and I had to start claiming these promises. In Desire of Ages, page 340, it says, even the power of demons is under the control of our Savior and the working of evil is overruled for good. That's letting me know that no matter how hard the enemy attacks me and how he knocks on the door of my heart, that I have to recognize that Savior has already won the victory over the enemy and that he has no power or authority anymore. And that if I recognize that the Savior has the power that I need, I have access to that if I'll ask. The greatest tool that has ever been given to me is Philippians 2 verse 5. It has such a broad application, even in its simplicity. Philippians 2 verse 5, I, I went to a friend and I was asking him how to find victory over this sin. And he broke this down to me for me in such a way, Bill Liversidge, he broke this down for me in such a way that was so beautiful that it's been a tool for me ever since. The only control that I have in this verse at all is the first word, and it's let. Let, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. And so let me ask you, panel, you know, does Jesus want me to have his mind? Yes. Yeah. Of course he does. Has he already won the victory for me to have a victorious mind? Yes. Absolutely. Exactly. Exactly. The only problem is, is that I have to give him permission, and I have to recognize that. And how simple that concept is. Oh. Just let it. Yeah, you yeah, know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. yeah. 
That's and you know something, the gospel has to be pretty simple for somebody like me. I don't have a degree, I don't have all these letters after my name, I'm basically just a broken down sinner. So when you can give me something simple, a formula that I can follow, then like you said, it makes the gospel simple. Mm -hmm. Let me give you an example. One day I was stepping into the shower and, and I'm surrounded by soap. I'd had the victory over my sin for many months. And so all of a sudden this dirty thought comes into my mind and, and of course I want it because if I didn't want my temptation, it wouldn't be a temptation, would it? Mm -hmm. So we have to acknowledge the fact that the devil wasn't baptized when I was, that the devil is still alive and he's able to throw these slime balls at me that was my history and my memory of what I indulged in for all those years. So as I'm standing there in the shower and he throws a slime ball at me, I'm, I'm having this dirty thought, but now I, I'm struggling. You know, this, this thought and this dirty thought is actually demanding my attention and, and the craving is strong. But also now I want to serve my Savior. My Savior is calling for my allegiance as well. So now I have this, this decision to make inside my mind. I think what's really important to establish is the fact that there's a difference between temptation and sin. And what's really amazing is that just because I'm tempted, it doesn't mean that I'm to the point of sinning, but it's what I do with that temptation that's going to make the difference. And on my own, I don't have the ability to even uh, handle this temptation without it slamming me. So in my mind, in the bathroom there, all of a sudden the Holy Spirit spoke to me and he said, Mike, claim the promise. And in my frustration, I'm like, what promise? And he said, Philippians 2 verse 5, it came into my mind so clearly. A and he said, give me permission to take that dirty, nasty thought. Mm. In my frustration, there's this conflict going on. It's like, I want to serve my Savior, but I want my sin. And I'm surrounded by soap. I could have it over in just a moment. And just then, in my frustration, I said, fine. I give you permission to take this dirty, nasty thought, because if you don't, I'm going to indulge my sin. What was so amazing is that that next moment, my next thought was about baseball, and I hate baseball. <laughs> it's like amazing that, that God gave me the victory immediately. I didn't have time to step out of the shower and read the Bible for two hours. Mm. I didn't have time to go on a three-day fast. I needed relief then. And as just claiming what He's already provided for me, I don't have to wait for my deliverance. My deliverance is right here and right now if I claim the promise and allow Him to give me righteous and holy thoughts. Mm -hmm. uh, amen. Yes, yes, my favorite verse. Admitting and submitting. This was a process that I think is really powerful. Admitting and submitting. I call it the, the one-two punch for the enemy. The first thing is that I have to admit that I'm being tempted. Process of admitting to yourself that you are what you are going through. And so when those thoughts come in my head, you know, a lot of times I would take those thoughts and I'd just stick them in my pocket and I'd go, well, uh, I'm not being tempted. And so, again, back to Jeremiah 17, uh, 9, that the mind is deceitful. I love my sin. If you didn't love your sin, it wouldn't be a temptation. And so you're always going to try to convince yourself how you can get back to this sinful thing. And so even if I was good, like, oh, I've been good. It's been three months since I've indulged in pornography. And so I would reward myself by this thing that was a sin. So I buy into this lie, recognizing that I will always want my sin because sin is desirable, especially after you've allowed it to make inroads into your life for many years. So admitting that I'm being tempted is the first step. If I'll just admit that I'm being tempted, I'm halfway there. So now this, this dirty, nasty thought comes in my head. Now I've got something to do with that. This is the difference between a temptation and a sin. It's what I do with this that's going to make the difference. On my own, I can't touch it. I can't handle it. I can't even stick it in my pocket because eventually, whether it's a day, a week, or a month, it's still going to have access to me. In James chapter 1 and 14 and 15, it says that when, sin ha when lust has been conceived, it brings forth sin. And when sin is finished, it brings forth death. Mm -hmm. And so people talk to me and they go, well, masturbation isn't listed in the Bible. And let's just assume that when we say porn, we're talking about either sexual acting out or masturbation. And so now that I've got this temptation, temptation isn't conceived immediately, or it's conceived immediately, but it, does, it isn't delivered. Like when a woman is pregnant, it takes nine months before she delivers, right? So okay, just because I'm being tempted doesn't mean that I'm gonna indulge in this sin, but I've left the door open for the enemy. And so I might stick this in my pocket and so the enemy has access to me. And so whether it's a week or that night or whatever, the enemy is going to use this temptation to stick his foot in the door and have access to my mind. One of the most amazing things is if we look in the Bible, Jezebel was a very wicked sexual queen, right? But she was a queen of Israel, you know, so here she had access to God's good and holy people. But there was that moment, remember, when, when she was putting on her lipstick and, and she stuck her face out the window and she enticed the servant of the Lord to come up and have sex with her. And what did he say? Are there any eunuchs up there? You know, throw her out. And they threw her out the window and she, she was mangled mess on the ground. And remember, the dogs ate her. So the servant of the Lord went in and had lunch. He was hungry after all that work. But then when he came out, he realized 
that there were three parts of Jezebel that the dogs wouldn't even touch. She was so vile. Do you remember what they were? No. Her hands, her feet, and her skull. It's interesting because sin originates in the mind. And, and once we understand that, here's what I think is so profound is that it's not an abomination, the sex act that we have. What's an abomination is it destroys our ability to relate to God on an intimate level. So the sexual thoughts that would come into Jezebel's mind, her feet would take her to where her hands would act out the thoughts that were in her mind. So once I got victory over what my hands and my feet were taking me to do, I still had to struggle and realize that sex begins and ends in the mind. And so that's how it destroys me. And so what I had to realize is that when that temptation comes, it's what I do with it according to the mind. And James chapter 1 affirms that. So not when, when, when uh, lust has been conceived, it brings forth sin. And eventually sin brings forth death. So now that I have this temptation, the second step is submitting it to God for deliverance. On my own, I can't do this step. I didn't die on the cross for my sins. I didn't win the victory over temptation. And so if you want deliverance right now from your sin, you have to do the second part. So, okay, now that I've admitted my sin, now I can take that sin and I can submit it to my higher covering. He has the ability to cancel its power and authority over me if mm -hmm. I'm just submitted to him. Mm -hmm. And learning this process, again, is just like that muscle, training that muscle. And I won't get it right perfectly every time. But if I learn the process of admitting and submitting, admitting and submitting, and as I go through this process, eventually what used to take me over will be something that I can manage, understanding that process as that muscle gets stronger by use. So when men come up to me and women come up to me talking about their pornography addiction, I tell them that the victory is sure. It's guaranteed working the steps, but the only thing that's a variable in this equation is your cooperation to the promises that have already been provided. Mm -hmm. I think it's amazing. Yeah, for sure. Wow. I guess what could also be added is a replacement to what okay. they were doing as well. Because sure. now there's this, I guess, this void, or now they have, I don't know, more time on their hands or whatever the case. Uh -huh. And idle hands are, are the devil's uh, playground, right? right? So, and also when you were mentioning, you know, your shower experience, yeah. um, your thoughts had to be replaced with something else, or you had to have already had Philippians in your mind for that to be a strength mm -hmm. for you to communicate with God. So I think replacing is well, part also... Part of my prayer also is I gave God permission to oh, yeah. remind me, to for help sure. me. Mm -hmm. You know, because I could ignore his calls, mm -hmm. but if I'm giving him permission, he's going to speak a little bit louder when I'm under temptation. And I like what you said about replacing. It's really important because there's dopamine that's released whenever you masturbate or look at pornography because this dopamine is powerful. It's like heroin in the back of your mind. So whenever you have a sexual release, whatever you're looking at, your, your body takes a picture of it and says, wow, that was really great. Let's do that again. And so whether it's a phone, a piece of paper, another human being, a dog, a cat, or a dead person, it has the same effect. Because the brain takes a picture, the dopamine releases wow. there. Yeah. So now if you're, if you're restricting yourself from the dopamine that's wrong, you know, by not indulging in pornography or sexual situations, it is good to replace that dopamine with good dopamine. And you get a dopamine release whenever you exercise. You know, you get dopamine releases that are in a good and healthy way that help to replace the drive and, and the um, desire for the bad dopamine. So I'm really glad that you brought that out because I think that that's really powerful. And I think it's really neat how God actually designed our brains because, you know, uh, uh, he made us this way that we need to take this photograph and we imprint on that. and. There's a, there's a pastor that has a series, you can see some of his stuff on YouTube, uh, um, Laugh Your Way to a Better Marriage, if you've ever seen how he kind of describes our brains of the man really take a picture and then want to recreate that picture. And, and so if you have, you know, taken pictures of situations, pornography situations, or very risky picture, situations, um, then what when you come into a normal relationship, that's not what's exciting to you because the brain is right. constantly trying to recreate that uh, imagery that it's that it's taken those photographs of. Scott, that, that's really powerful because let's talk about the dopamine that God wants to give us. And, and the devil watched as we were being created and he knows the dopamine release because if we do it according to God's way, you're looking at your opposite sex spouse and you're looking into her eyes or his eyes. And, and then as you have that sexual release, you're taking a picture of her or him. You know, how beautiful, because God wants you to desire her, to touch her, to hold her, to imprint with her. Because in Genesis chapter 2, it says the two shall be one flesh. When we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and 16, it says, What? Don't you know that when you have sex with a prostitute, that the two become one flesh? And so the dopamine works whether we do it the right way 
or the wrong way. And so every time that we have that dopamine release, we connect ourselves to this thing like super glue. And so it was designed to, to, to hold us with our spouse because you know, eventually we get old, we're not so desirable looking, we have kids, we have financial issues, but it's that dopamine release that's gonna hold you together to your spouse to help lock you in. I have young people that have come up to me and they thought that pornography was only gonna be an issue uh, until they got married. And now these young men and young women in their early 20s are talking about the fact that they can't have a sexual release with their spouse because they're so used to the pornography that they can't have a, a sexual release unless they're either thinking about it or looking at it. Wow. And so pornography destroys our ability to relate intimately to each other. And isn't that the abomination of God? It destroys the gift that I gave you to be able to touch and to feel and experience, you know, the person that I gave you to love. And one of the greatest things I think as a human being is your need for food and sex. <laughs> so you, you destroy that, uh, you know, very core uh, fundamental need that we have as humans to have this intimate connection. All right, I want to share with you um, Keegan, his story a little bit. Um, he talks about the fact that he was molested at a birthday party in fifth grade. What does that make him? Twelve? Oh, wow. Right? Five and seven? Yep, twelve years old. So here he was like twelve years old. The, the kids found a pornography magazine and they didn't have a girl, so they helped Keegan down and they raped him. Many of them, of the kids that were in, the, in, the, um, in this party. And so what that did is he started spiraling out of control with these thoughts, thinking that he was bisexual. He started to experiment at it. It felt good. It affirmed that for him. But then he, through Christ, he found his way out of that. But he talks about some really important things, talking about victory over sexual sin. Uh, take a listen. That when I left that place, I was, I was left with the decision of who I was going to choose. Was I going to go back to the world, or was I going to go back to, or was I going to stay with Jesus? I was already with him, so was I going to stay with Jesus? And with freedom comes responsibility, and I was responsible for where my feet was going to take me. I was responsible for what was going to fall into my hands. I was responsible for what I was going to think up here and what I was going to say from my mouth. I had to say, Lady Gaga, shut up! I was not born this way but I was born a son of the Most High God. I was born a revolutionist. I was born a revivalist. And I had to just allow myself to get away with the Lord and choose Him. And this thought comes to my mind, this vi video pornographic image, you know, came to my mind. And I started to think on this and play this thing in my mind. And I'm like, no, Jesus, Jesus, I don't want this. I don't want to think this way. No, 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 I, what do I do, what do I do? And He said, son, renew your mind. And I was like, how do I do that? And he was like, just change your mind. And it was like the Lord it was speaking to me and teaching me through all of this. And he says, renew your mind. And so I renew my mind and I said, I don't want to think of that thought. In the name of Jesus, go. And I thought of a fire truck because I renewed my mind because I wasn't, I wasn't going to entertain that thought. And so Romans 12, 2 says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you, I love this part so that you can prove the will of God that which is perfect, good, and acceptable. And so I had the choice to say, who am I gonna serve here? My flesh and my desire that wants to keep thinking of this thought so I can get aroused for maybe 20 minutes, 30, however long it'll take, or am I gonna choose Jesus? And I'm gonna say, okay, I don't want that, I want you. I, I like this concept, don't run from God, run to Him. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it is so true that that we often just want to like you know like shield ourselves from his judgments um but instead of looking at it like that it's like no he's your he's your help he's your salvation you know it, when you're when you're about ready to struggle run to him yeah so taking that example and then applying it for the first time that sin entered the world you know what did adam do when he sinned he felt guilty and condemned yeah. and what did he do is he he hid himself and then I love that how Jesus, when he was coming to Adam, he, he didn't like, you know, condemn him. And, you know, he just was like, hey, where are you? Yeah. You know, how like God in his tender compassion, not to expose you, but instead to to um, reconcile with you and to say, hey, where did you go? You think God didn't know where he was? Do you think that yeah. Jesus didn't know that he was hiding behind a bush? But isn't that beautiful that he gave him the opportunity to confess where he was? And then when he did, he says, well, who told you you were naked? Mm. I love that he didn't condemn him. What he did is he allowed himself to confess what he had done. Isn't that beautiful? Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and so the same thing, which says to me that if we, if we think that God hates us and that he wants to pull the rug out from under us, 
it lets me know that I don't have a full understanding of God and His love. Mm. I, ha I have the wrong picture of who God is. Mm. Mm. And I like how much responsibility he's taking. It's like a partnership, you know, you and God. It's not that you, can, you, you should submit, yes, but then you don't just sit there. Mm. You know, mm -hmm. you have to put in the work. Do your best and God will do the rest. Wow, beautiful, mm -hmm. beautiful. Yeah, good point. If you fail, and if you mess up, or if you feel like you did something wrong and that Jesus wasn't pleased with you, don't allow the enemy to steal you away for a day, two days, maybe a week. Don't get into condemnation to where you feel like he's too far or you messed up. Automatically go back to the throne of grace, go back to the mercy seat and say, Jesus, I need you. And I, want, and I need you to wash me with your blood. And I need you to, of course, be my savior in this situation, but also be my king. Rule and reign over me so that I don't think those thoughts anymore. There's that position where, you, where Jesus is no longer just your savior, but he's also your Lord and your king where he's the one that calls the shots, where he's the one that guides you and instructs you. He's the one that rules and reigns over your life. And so you have to step out of that, that place of saying, I always need to be saved and step into the place where I will always be submitted and you can do whatever you want. But if you do mess up, I encourage that you don't allow the enemy to have three days where you're not spending time with the Father, where you're not because that's what he wants. Initially, he wants to separate you from God. Sin separates you from God. And if you're in sin, quickly get back to the presence of the Lord. Quickly clean up. And there's that place of repentance, of course. There's that place of saying, I don't want to be like that. God, change me and transform me. But don't get down in the pit where he's at. Rise above it and be with the Lord. Amazing. Yeah. That's where, like, when you read the stories in Jeremiah, it, God is always like, "Return unto me, return unto mm -hmm. me." Mm -hmm. Like, you know, turn, turn away from your 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 evil ways, and 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 I will quickly forgive. You know, um, it's a neat picture. Yeah, I'm thinking about the prodigal son story. You know, the prodigal, he was like, "My dad doesn't want me. I'm sitting here eating with pigs, and I've done all this stuff, blew all his money." But like, out of desperation, you know, he went back, and his dad sees him and runs to him. You know, he runs to his son, and not like, oh, you're back again, you know. Oh, I know, right? And I did not even understand that for myself. And some of it was based on, on the father that I had, that I, that I felt that I had to be perfect for him to accept me or to love me. So, of course, I transitioned that or transferred that to who my heavenly father was as well. Mm -hmm. And it was only through a relationship with Jesus Christ that actually broke that down for me. And I realized that, wow, even while I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me meaning that, that it's Christ reaching out that, that doesn't go away and that I'm really responding to nothing more than the invitation already from the Holy Spirit. The desire of age, not desire of ages, but uh, Christ's object lessons talks about that, that while the guy was like laying in the slop with the pigs and feeding the pigs, the thought came into his head to go mm -hmm. back home. Wow. It wasn't the thought that he put there, it was the thought from the Holy Spirit and he was answering the call. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah, he could have ignored that thought, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I wanna share with you, uh, yeah, this one, this one is amazing. This was so powerful for me. Because once we fall into our sexual sin, the guilt and the condemnation, I was already under the covering of the enemy because I'd given into my sin. I thought that I was hearing the Holy Spirit saying that you're pathetic, you're worthless and condemned and your probation is closed. When now I realize that when I fell into my sin, that I was actually listening to the voice of the enemy. And I think that this is really powerful to talk about that. He is a liar. He's the father of all lies, we know that. And I've, I'm sure you've heard, don't empower the liar. And the thing about Satan is Satan is worthless. And he wants you to make you feel like you're worthless. Satan has failed God. And he wants you to feel like you failed God. Satan is sick. And he wants you to be sick. Satan is dying and he's always in fear. And he wants you to be dying and always in fear. And so when I, you know, I, what I like to encourage people is that when you feel like you failed God, or you feel like you're worthless, or you feel like you have messed up really, really bad, that's the enemy. And the only power that the enemy has is the power that you give him. So let's not empower the liar. And so, and, and it's just simply as saying, I'm not gonna think of that thought. This is what God says about me. And whatever he says about you, that he's ravished at one glance from your heart, or that you're his son and he's your father, or when he says he wants to abide in you and you abide in him, whatever it may be, just take passages of scripture that is truth 
and allow the truth to set you free and set you free not only from something but into something and that's into his heart. Amen. Isn't that amazing? And so I had to go again from feelings into faith and so this is how I felt and even before I would clean myself up, I would say to God, Lord, this is how I feel. I feel condemned, I feel worthless. But your word says that if I come to you as I am, worthless and helpless, throwing myself on your mercy, that you will always take me back, that you will never reject me. And so I would claim those promises. And so like, like Tegan said, or Keegan says that instead of running from God, I would run to him. And so it wouldn't take me days or weeks before I'd come back to God. I could come back to him as I was, dirty and defiled and know that he would clean me up. That was a really amazing tool for me. Ministry of Healing 71 was really the, the life changer for me. As a matter of fact, it's one of my favorite books. And so as I was going to the Sex Addicts Anonymous classes for a year, after a year, I was really frustrated because while I did have transparency, I wasn't having victory, nor was anybody else in this group. I look at this book and it says, Ministry of Healing, who wants to read that? But as I started opening up the pages of that book, it didn't talk about my sin, my problem with pornography and masturbation, but what it started talking about was my Savior, who had already won the victory for me. And even on the first page, page 17, it says that the Savior came to restore men completely, physically, spiritually, and mentally. Again, those, those three strands of that rope. And so in my margin, I put a circle and I said, this is on you, God. You said that you came to restore me because I can't do it. And when I started to realize that the transition had to be that I had to claim what had already been done for me, even in my helpless and unworthiness, I started to find that victory again. And that book, I believe, has the answer for every sin temptation, every addictive drive that we may have. And those pages are rich with the healing that I was desperate for. So here's one of them. Ministry of Healing, page 71, it says, He is watching over you, trembling child of God. Are you tempted? He will deliver. Are you weak? He will strengthen. Are you ignorant? He will enlighten. Are you wounded? He will heal. One of the things that I really realized is that the woundedness was what was causing me to go to my addiction. The, the, the problem that began with pornography and masturbation, actually it wasn't even pornography, it was fantasy in my mind and masturbation at 13 years old was basically begun because I didn't receive the love from my father, the rejection that I got from the kids in school, the fact that we were living in this horrible situation, my mom's a single mother and, and acting out sexually as well and my sister's chasing me around with butcher knives. The only relief that I found was that time in the bathroom alone and this became my best friend. And I want to talk about that a little bit as well. Any comments? Powerful. <laughs> good, good, good. Ministry of Healing also goes on. It says, come unto me is his invitation. Whatever your anxieties and trial, I love this part. He encourages us to spread out our case before him. And he said, your spirit will be braced for endurance. The way will be open for you to disentangle yourself from embarrassment and difficulty. The weaker and more helpless you know yourself to be, the stronger you will become in his strength. Whose strength? His, his strength. strength. The heavier your burdens, the more blessed is the rest in casting them upon the burden bearer. Wow, and just processing this, what I would do is I would take these passages and I would convert them or transcribe uh, them into first person. Because you know what, this isn't a message for you guys, it's a message for me personally. Mm -hmm. And as I did that, I started to claim these promises and the victory started to come. I have a question just yeah. popped in my head. Um, uh, what would your response be to someone who says, you know, where was God? Why does it always seem that God comes later? Um, during your, your, I'll just use your experience because you were sharing yeah. as a child, you know, um, the lack of relationship with your father and, and how your sisters treated you in school mm -hmm. and all this. And why do we have to go through a lifetime of all this trial and all this pain and then in the end we become victorious? Mm -hmm. Where is God through all those instances? Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't have a, a verbal answer, but I have a story. And, mm -hmm. and whenever like somebody comes to me and they've been molested or abused, as a child and they're angry at God for why they allowed something like that to happen, uh, I really didn't have an answer. But there was a, um, a, a man who was molested at five years old by his mother's boyfriend. Mother and father were together, the father was at work, mother was an alcoholic and she'd have her lover come over. So they'd get drunk, she'd pass out, and then the lover would actually molest this little five-year-old boy. And this little boy, he remembers being in the closet and he would look through the slats of the closet door and he would see that man's feet you know, his shoes, and he would say, you know, Sai, where are you? Where are you, Sai? And so at 35 years old, this came into this man's mind, but you know, his mother had passed away when he was five. His father gave him away for a year so that he could put his life back together. But then when he got Sai back, here's a little boy that's six years old that had lost his mother and his father. 
And so there were a lot of deep wounds that had begun at that age, not uh, even adding on to it the molestation from this man. So now he, he um, ends up being uh, this, this homosexual. He was also transgender. He was about to have the sex change. He was living as a woman. Um, and the Lord entered his heart. And then he eventually uh, got married, had a child. He never had this exchange. Uh, now he has an international ministry and he's 35 years old. And all of a sudden, all this anger and this rage about what that man did to him and how it derailed his life came into his head and he got angry. And he started losing it at work and he would get sent home and he'd start yelling at his wife and kid. And he started crying out to God and he said, Lord, what is going on? And the Lord said, what's going on? What's the matter? And he said, just tell me. And Sai so said, I'm angry. I'm so angry about what that man did to me. I'm so angry about he, what he took from me. And he said, well, what do you want me to do about it? And he said, I want my pound of flesh. I want to know that what happened to me mattered. And I'm not just going to tuck it away and pretend like it never happened. I want justice for what was done to me. And so God said, well, what do you want me to do to him? You want me to publicly humiliate him? Yes. And he was just raging. And he says, yeah, you know, expose him about what he did to that five-year-old kid because that screwed up my life. And he said, well, what else? You know, should I, should I beat him in public? Absolutely. You know, beat him in public for what he did to me. And he just kept going on in this rage, this anger of what that five-year-old boy had to endure all these years that hadn't been unpacked was now finally coming out. All this unforgiveness, right? And eventually God said to him, he said, well, what if I run him out of town on a rail? Absolutely. Everything that God said, you know, so I was like, that's right. Whatever it takes to, to end this pain and what that man did to me. And eventually he said, so, all right, so I, what if I nail him to a cross? And Sai's so like, what? what? What are you talking about? And God was telling him, he said, I paid for what that man did to you. He said, I had to allow people's choices to, to run their course. And I had to stand by. I was there in that closet with you when that man abused you. I was there when all of that thing, those things happened, when your mother was killed by her, by her drunk driving and the fact that your father sent you away, the fact that you lived as a woman for two years and, and I intervened in your life. He said, I had to sit there and with my hands folded, allow sin to take its course, but I paid the price of what that man could never pay back for you. I paid that debt so that if you accept my son as your savior, then you can be free and to know that justice was paid for what happened to you. He said justice was also paid for what you took from other people. And so how beautiful that God demonstrates that he's not asking us for to just suck it up and pretend like it never happened. He said, I paid for it, but I had to allow sin to take its course. And in the process, his perfect spotless son stood in my place to pay for what I could never pay back. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Uh, does that answer? It does. Isn't it that does. amazing? It's, wow. Yeah. It's a lot to take in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I want to talk about the dogs in the garage. What was so amazing is I asked my church for a men's ministry. And you know what I took, um, uh, there was a, it was going to be Father's Day weekend. It was going to be um, at a retreat, you know, in the woods. And, the, and I had a speaker that was willing to come. And I presented it to my board. And one of the elders on the board took the book and he threw it down and he pointed right at me. And he said, I don't want to be running around in the woods like a bunch of gay men. And so here I was asking for a men's ministry in my church because I needed to know how to interact with men, right? Non-sexually. And so I didn't get the men's ministry that I was asking for, but God gave me a men's ministry. As I started to find that victory in ministry of healing, there were men in my church that came to me and they said, listen, Mike, I'm not gay, but I struggle with pornography. And I've been married for 35 years. Another man came to me. He was struggling with pornography and his wife caught him and they had a brand new baby and she wanted a divorce. These men were desperate for tools, but they couldn't go to their church just like I couldn't. But they came to me privately. And you know what? Every Tuesday night, at six o'clock in my living room, we would open the pages of Ministry of Healing. And the same victory that God gave me, he was giving to them as well. What was so amazing is my friend who was getting the victory, he, he was telling me the story. He said, you know, Mike, it was a Friday night and, and, um, and it was cold outside. And I told my kids, I said, don't put the dogs in the garage. It's not gonna be that cold, they'll be all right. Next morning he gets up, ready to go to church and he opens up the garage door and he let the dogs, his children had let the dogs in the garage at night. They had gotten sick. Something that they had eaten got them sick. They had diarrhea and vomiting all over the garage on that cement floor. Can you imagine what that smelled like or looked like? And he thought to himself, yeah, I'm ready for church. I'm not going to clean this up. So he went to church. He came back. He changed his clothes and he started to clean up all of this nasty filth. Can you imagine what it smelled like now, even after several hours, right? So he's cleaning up this mess, this filth, and it's soaking into the cement floor. The smell is strong. It's the Sabbath, right, in the afternoon. And as he's moving these boxes and cleaning up all this filth, this thought came into his head and he said, you know something? He said, I'm not even angry at my daughters for disobeying me. 
He said, this is really their problem, but I don't mind cleaning up after them. And just then, as he was walking in the victory in his own life, the Holy Spirit spoke to him and said, you know what? I don't mind cleaning up after you either. Wow. And he started to realize that he could never clean up this mess. Did you ever see a child try to change their own diaper? Imagine <laughs> what that looks like. And so, you know, if you can if you can see the compassion of a father that would look at a child that's trying to clean up its own diaper and realize that you can't do that, that that's something that I can only do for you. Then can you transfer that same thing to, to a loving God that looks at us in our filth and in our mess and says, if you'll just submit to me, I can clean you up and I can repackage you. And how beautiful for this object lesson that, you know, that Jesus is the only one that can clean up our mess and he doesn't mind. It's as a matter of fact, that's his job. That's what he knows that because of our unworthiness and our own inability to, to get the victory over us. And he says, let me do it for you. Imagine the frustration of a, of a, a loving parent who recognizes that they're the only ones that can clean you, but the kid runs from you, right? You know, and so a, a kid can actually run from their parent even though they have a messy diaper and you know that they're just sitting in their mess. So imagine again, you know, if a, if a normal father can be that loving towards their son or daughter, then imagine how God is towards us. Mm. Testimonies, volume four, page 349 says, the victory can be gained for nothing is impossible with God. By his assisting grace, all evil temper, all human depravity may be overcome. Every Christian must learn of Christ. Isn't that beautiful? collecting these promises. Cry unto the Lord, tempted soul. Throw your helpless unworthiness upon Jesus and claim his very promise. The Lord will hear. That's a promise right there. He knows how strong are the inclinations of the natural heart and he will help in every time of temptation. All right, here we go. And so I like to demonstrate this story because it was so powerful for how the whole Holy Spirit really spoke to me about this issue. My mother smoked for 50 years. I never struggled with it. I thought it was disgusting. But I remember my mother quit smoking and after 15 years, I asked my mom, I said, mom, aren't you really happy that you quit smoking? And she said to me, she said, you know, it's like I lost my best friend. She said, not a day goes by that I don't think about cigarettes. And I looked at her and I go, your best friend? She goes, yeah, my cigarettes were there in the good times and the bad. She said, when your father left me, my cigarettes were there. When I go out partying with my friends, my cigarettes were there. And she said, each and every day, I still think about it. And I looked at her and I said, but mom, I said, your, your best friend was killing you. And just then the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, Mike, your best friend's killing you. And I realized that because of this, 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 this thing that had become my best friend, the masturbation had become my best friend, that it was really difficult to let that go. But who really wants to be my best friend, right? Jesus, right. And so anything that, that gets in the way of my friendship with Jesus Christ is, of course, not only going to steal my life, but also uh, not give me the best friend that I really need. And so I had to realize that my best friend was killing me, and I had to actually recognize the fact that this thing had to go in my life. Hatred of sin is vital to full salvation. Humanly speaking, no man is safe until he has learned this, to hate his sin as deeply as he formerly loved it. He may resist it, he may even flee from it, but as long as there is a lingering love of sin in the heart, he is not on safe ground. It goes on to say, as love of good is vital, so also is hatred of evil. It may truly be said that our capacity for the love of the good is measured and balanced by our capacity for hatred of evil. And so as I went to this man I, that I trusted and I finally divulged to him as a Christian that I was struggling with uh, masturbation still. And he said, you know, Mike, you have, to you have to picture this as this big ugly beast and it's chained to your leg. And he said, and as long as you're indulging it, this beast is fat and happy, and, and, but now you come into a relationship with Jesus Christ and you recognize that, that this beast has to go. All right, so maybe I don't indulge in it every day, maybe once a week, maybe once a month, but now my, my beast is, is not as fat and happy, he's starving, but he's still alive. And as long as his heart is beating, he's still chained to my leg, I drag him through my relationship with Jesus Christ and eventually he's gonna take me out. He said, until you determine that the beast must die, you'll never have victory over your sin. He said, you've got to stab it in the heart, you've got to slit its throat, and you've got to stomp its head. Otherwise, you'll never have victory over your sin. That was a very valuable piece of information for me because I had to quit kidding myself into thinking that I could keep this beast around and that I had to determine that the beast had to die. And at that moment, when I determined that I wanted this out of my life, change really started to happen because God could not go against my will. The last example that I like to give to people is um, about this this um, men's meeting that they had for people that struggled with pornography and sexual addiction. And my friend went. There were 32 men. They were all addicted somehow. My friend had had victory over his pornography addiction for a while, but his wife encouraged him to go to this weekend. 
they had each one of them had a counselor that was with them they spent the whole weekend talking about testimonies talking about tools for overcoming and so on the very last day what they did is they brought all 32 men and their counselors into this maze that they had made in the center of this huge room 32 men and their counselors so we're talking about 64 people in this maze right and so the idea is that they're all blindfolded and they have to find their way out they can only ask their counselor questions right and so here they are they're in this maze but they didn't know it but they closed the maze off there's no way out and what i realized is that what is that is what sexual sin does to us is we walk into it willingly or even blindfolded and then we find ourselves trapped and there's no way out now they're with their counselors and they give them 45 minutes and they say now go find your way out so as these men 32 men with their counselors are fighting trying to find their way out knocking into chairs knocking into each other you can imagine it was a pretty desperate situation but of course there's no way out so my friend is in the middle of this mix his counselor is with him and as he's going through all of a sudden about 12 minutes later one man got out and so he's thinking wow one guy got out out of 32 so that meant 31 men still in this maze and they're fighting struggling trying to get out after a few minutes he asked his he raises his hand as his counselor comes over and he says what's your question and he said is there a way out and he said i can't answer that he stepped away so as he's fighting in this maze you know a few minutes later one other guy got out two guys out of 32 right 30 men still in the middle of this maze 40 minutes goes by and still nobody nobody else has gotten out and he starts to realize that these men are breaking down they're starting to cry they're sobbing because they're frustrated that they can't find their way out and my friend raises his hand again and his counselor comes over and he whispers and he says what's your question and the, and the question that he had is he said will you help me out and he said that's the right question and he walked him out of the circle three men out of 32 men were the only men that got out because even no matter what they heard throughout that weekend they didn't realize that only without the help of Jesus Christ could they find victory over the sin that they were seeking and that's what I realize also is that God didn't ask me to do it by myself he knew that on my own I can't do it he's not afraid to clean up my mess he's not afraid to walk with me out of this thing if I'll just reveal what my need is that he's more than willing to take me as I am dirty and defiled and to clean me up and to walk this walk with me as long as it takes until I find that victory because at the end of my victory not only do I have victory over my sexual sin I now have an established intimate relationship with my Savior which is I believe what he's trying to restore in all men Wow it makes me think of that uh, poem where you know you see the footprints on the sand mm -hmm. and uh, you know all of a sudden the guy asked the question you know where were you God and would do I only see one pair of footprints and he said God said I was carrying you mm -hmm. you know I mean he's willing to take our hands and help us through these situations and it is only uh, a, a willing heart that we need and he would do the rest yeah. amen amen Wow, Mike, that was powerful. And I hope that this conversation gets continued. Um, we're going to keep hammering away and putting information out. Uh, Mike, what, what are some resources that we have? Yeah, there's a great series called the Conquer Series. And it comes with uh, two sets of DVDs, six in each. So that's 12 DVDs. It also comes with two workbooks and a journal. It's an amazing program. It also talks about accountability and restoration, and it's a totally Christian uh, resource. I find it exceptional. There's also a movie called uh, The Heart of Man, which I also recommend highly. It talks about the addictive process, how it becomes an addiction, but most importantly, it also talks about a loving God that's willing to go after us no matter how deep we've fallen into our sin and to deliver us and bring us out. Not just that, but we also have a list of counselors that are available. Uh, if you contact comingoutministries.org, we're more than happy to uh, connect you to some of them and to also begin conversations about how to find victory in your sin. Comingoutministries.org, you can find them on Facebook. You can communicate with us. Uh, we'll give you their contact information if you guys uh, need to know. But definitely, you are not alone in this struggle. Uh, you know, many, many, many people are battling this. And like Mike gave us some great advice, you know, Christ is wanting to help you and literally lead you out of this maze. Mm -hmm. So give him an opportunity. He will see you through. And we thank you for checking this out. See you in the next one. Bye. Bye, guys. <laughs>